serve you evermore. I will glorify the name of the Lord. And evermore, I'll adore you. to the Peace Country Pentecostals. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. I don't know how to check the schedule. Amen. Announcements this week, there's youth this Friday night at 7 o'clock, Sunday services at 1030. Let's invite somebody out to the House of God service, Purpose Institute as well. Uh, on Friday night, Brother Albert Foster, who is an uh, accountant, he is going to be doing the leadership, the leadership seminar on Friday night for Purpose Institute. And it begins at 7 o'clock, and he's going to be doing going over some personal financial things if you're interested to do with budgets and finances. He is uh, quite a sought-after accountant, so he is going to give us a couple hours. If you are bored of numbers, <laughs> don't come, because it's going to be numbers. But we'll make it fun. And then on Saturday, we also have classes for Purpose Institute for those that are enrolled. And if you haven't enrolled yet, please enroll. We're having a great time with that. And Sunday services at 1030. Unfortunately, Brother Foster is not going to be able to be with us. Uh, Sister Foster is um, going for some testing, and so he'll be heading back on Saturday evening. But um, we're going to have service nonetheless. Acts chapter 17, didn't we have a great service on Sunday with um, Brother Andrew Clark, amen, great presence of the Lord, great message about prevailing voices and not listening to the prevailing voices of the crowd that try to tell us to crucify him, but we want to hear his voice. Tapped right into where we are, or to what we've been talking about, getting close to God. So if you have your Bibles or if you want to pay attention to the screen, Acts chapter 17 and 24 says this, that God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on, the, on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him. So there's that scripture, Dad, that we need, that we found the Lord. We find him, though he be not far from any, every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since the fall of mankind, we've been born incomplete as, as human beings. We have been born incomplete since Adam and Eve, our great, great, great forefathers, um, disobeyed God and failed and, and man fell and sin entered into our nature. But most of us here, we are still blessed with five physical senses. I find that these senses start to ail us a little bit the older that we get, but we're blessed with five physical senses. We can, we can see, and we can hear, and we can smell, and we can feel, and we can taste. And it would be difficult for us to imagine, and thankfully that we all have it, it would be difficult for us to imagine our lives without these senses. There would, there would really be no window into the world because these five senses that we have, every one of us, they're our window into the world. And without them, we would have no knowledge of anything. We wouldn't know what things look like, what things feel like, what things smell like, what things sound like. All of these five senses work together, what make up our reality and how our natural world around us, how it really works. Imagine if you have never seen anything. You would have no reference point or knowledge of what anything would look like. You would have no idea what a human face looked like or, or the movement of expression that happens when somebody speaks or the emphasis of gesture as you uh, listen to somebody talk or the complexity of a crowd when you gather together or the colors even in this room. We would have no concept of them. Imagine the same if you would with any one of the other senses. If you didn't have them, you wouldn't know what 
what things, what, what, what things sounded like or what things felt like or smelt like. Um, no reference point or knowledge or reality to any common sense. It's almost unimaginable for us to really think of a world completely cut off of what we know to be reality. And uh, that's why I, 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 you know, I wish in my younger years as a carpenter that I would have taken care of certain aspects of my senses, especially my hearing, because I do find that my wife thinks I have selective hearing, but I don't. I'm actually losing my hearing. And so I do encourage everybody, if you can, take care of uh, your sight and your hearing because they're very important and you would want to live without them. And my heart goes out to those that have had to. It's almost unimaginable for us to think of a world that's completely cut off of what we know that these senses give us. No impulses, no information, no sight, no sound, no smell, no touch, no taste, nothing. The idea is strange. It's kind of foreign to us to imagine uh, maybe momentarily we went without sight or went without sound, went without taste, so on and so forth. But on a permanent basis, it's a foreign idea and hard for us to imagine because everything that we know exists because of these five senses, what we know, what we have knowledge of. Now, this is really, I, when I look at this and I look at the beginning, it was a little bit different from the beginning. Even though they had the five senses, I believe in the beginning there was also a sixth sense, what I'm going to talk about tonight. Adam and Eve had a sixth sense from the beginning. They, they, this sixth sense was just as real and apparent to them as the other five are for us today. And this sixth sense, if you allow me to phrase it this way, was not necessarily faith or belief in God, because faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Because in the beginning, God just was. He just was. To Adam and Eve, he just was. They didn't have to stretch their imagination to believe. They didn't have to hope for something. He just was there. He just existed. You see, the idea of God didn't originate with man. The idea of man was created by God. We didn't make up uh, uh, this, this idea of this God in our head. God had in his mind the creation of man. And so, so, that, so that's the way that it works. This is not just, God is not just a figment of our imagination. Even though now we have to stretch our faith in some areas to believe in God. Back in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't necessarily so. They walked with God. So he was just there. He just existed. It was just as common. The sense of God was just as common to Adam and Eve in the beginning as their five other senses were. He just existed. The sixth sense was the recognized presence and understood voice of God. Because if you read in Genesis chapter 3 and 8, and I already said it, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Before sin, Adam and Eve, they communed openly with God. They had an open relationship with God. It was as God was right there with them, as God was walking with them and talking with them. And he was just as real as any one of their five senses. And he still is. He still is. But there are some things that have now we're going to talk about that has separated us from that. They weren't afraid of him. He talked with them and they talked with him. It wasn't a strange thing. It, it simply was a part of them. It was just a common sense that God was there, that God existed. The I am. I am. And that settles it. I am. The sixth sense was the ability to recognize and respond to the presence and the voice of the Lord. And just as you and I, as we trust our other five senses, it was then and it is now needful for us to recognize, receive, develop, and trust what I'm talking about tonight, this sense of God. We have to recognize it first. We have to receive it. We have to develop it. We've got to use it. We've got to trust it that there is a sixth sense that you and I can have, a sense and an awareness of God being always there. He's as close as the mention of his name. Anytime that you need him, he's there. He's there. And that, you know, when we have that acute sense of God's presence that he's always there, can you imagine you watch your behavior around certain people? I mean, when you're around people, you don't, you know, people maybe of affluence or people that, that, 
you know, you act differently around people. You act differently around certain people. And if we could be constantly aware of the presence of God, can you imagine how much easier it would be for us to watch ourselves? To make sure that we watch our behavior? To make sure we watch what we say? To watch what we look at? Even to watch, even to really watch what we think about? Because when we're aware of His presence, we know that God knows even the thoughts of our heart. And so we're more acutely aware that God is there. We've got to develop this sense. We've got to understand, recognize it, and and receive it. It was sin that started to rob man of this sixth sense. It started to take it away. Now, I'm not so sure that it just disappeared instantly for Adam and Eve because even though they had fallen and they had disobeyed and they were driven from the garden, they were driven from the presence of God, they still must have... Uh, retain some remnant of that sense of God. Because if you read about it, their son Cain, he was even comfortable enough in the presence of God. And when you read the conversation that Cain had with God, he was even comfortable enough in the presence of God to be even a bit rude and forward with God. Because the Lord said to him in Genesis chapter 4 and 9, he said unto Cain, "Where where is Abel thy brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? That's actually being very rude and forward. I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, why are you asking me? So he was comfortable enough in the presence of God to even have that kind of communication with God. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, and thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from, the fa- from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in this earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain wasn't living in the Garden of Eden. He was rebellious. He had just killed his brother. But he still had a conversation with the Lord that was unlike any conversation that I have ever had with God. This man was was outside of the, the presence of God, so to speak, in the garden as it was, even though he had communion still with God. But there was still a common sense there that God was there and you could speak to him and you could talk to God. But from here we see where sin and the desires of the flesh, they worked a wedge between God and man from this time. We start to see, and even the Bible says that man's heart was only on evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he even made man. And I got thinking about that today, you know, we think about, okay, well, man's heart was only upon evil continually. We think, well, they must have been thinking about all the vices that we, you know, all the sexual immorality and addictions and all the bad things. They were stealing from each other. They were cheating each other. They were doing this and they were doing that. They were just bad human beings. But maybe that's not that maybe that's not what it was. Maybe it was just them uh, that allowing that sense of God to become dim and, and that knowledge of God, them pushing away the knowledge of God continually. And God said, all that their heart is on is their own things and their own lives and their own way. And their heart is not on me. And I, I consider that as being an evil heart. And so when we think about it that way, it's a little more real to you and I because we might not identify with those people that had evil on their heart continually when we think it was all, you know, just sex, drugs, and rock and roll because, oh, I can't identify with that. I don't think about that. But what about if it's just as simple as you and I thinking about our own way and our own knowledge and and relying on our own knowledge and not, not leaning on his His knowledge, leaning on our own understanding, as Proverbs says. But it's from there, when we look at that, we start to see kind of an erosion 
and a digression of people walking with God and talking with God. And that sense of God was just, they were losing that sense of God or they lost that sense of God. Of course, there was Noah. Noah had a, a, a perception of God and, and, and the, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then just through the cent- centuries, you know, if you look through the centuries in the Bible, even people that had a crippled, incomplete perception of God and the voice of God, even a, a crippled and incomplete perception of God could lift a person above the masses. They could find themselves in a place that no other human being could be just because they had an understanding of God and they could just faintly hear the voice of God. It lifted them above everybody else. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if you and I could get an understanding of hearing the voice of God and understanding the presence of God, You will set yourself so far apart from this world. I'm not talking about in a bad way, but you will set yourself apart from this world to be able to hear the voice of God and make a difference in our world. Make a difference in our world. And it will set you distinct from the masses of people because when you look throughout the history of the Bible, you know, it only seems that there's just a few people that that had that occasion, that, that made that effort to hear the voice of God, to understand the presence of God. There were some of the elites that you and I reread about. There was Abraham and Sarah. There was Isaac and Jacob. They sensed him. They didn't always understand, but their sense of his presence and and his voice, it made them great and it set them apart. And if you want to do great things in God and you want to be set apart, then it's important for us to hear the voice of God and understand the presence of God. Now, some of people are saying right now, like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to hear the voice of God. I don't know how to be understanding of the presence of God. Well, we'll talk about that just in a moment. And it's a growing understanding. You've got to understand that. It's a growing understanding. You and I, we don't get this all figured out overnight. But as we start this journey with God, we start to have a a greater understanding of the presence of God. And our ear becomes more attuned to the voice of God. As you walk with God, it's just like when you walk with anybody, you get to know their ways and you you get to know what pleases them and you get to hear their Bible says Jesus said, and we heard it already. My sheep know my voice. And the reason why that we know his voice, because we have heard his voice, we, we become aware and we become familiar with the voice of God in our lives. Joseph had a sense of God's presence. It, he, he had a dream, and that dream that the Lord gave him, that dream, God spoke to him through a dream, and it was that dream that kept him when he was cast down into that pit. And then he was sold into Potiphar's house, and then he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and then falsely accused, and then put into prison, and then left in prison by the butler and the baker, and then finally he arose out of prison to Potiphar's pa- or sorry to Pharaoh's palace, and then he was approached by his brother, and it was the voice of God through the dream that kept him, so he was aware of the voice of God in his life. And he said, what you have meant for evil, God has meant for good. That's knowing the voice of God. Moses met him in a burning bush and it changed his life forever. In fact, Moses, in my opinion, Moses had one of the most keenest sense of the voice of God and the presence of God of anybody in the scriptures. He was very keen with God and the presence and the voice of God. Now today... Such an intimate and apparent recognition of the presence and the voice of God. It's so rare that people recognize the presence of God on a consistent basis and hear the voice of God. It's virtually non-existent. And I'm, I'm not disrespecting anybody in this room, but there's only a select few of us that are here tonight. And, and, and if all of us have an understanding of the presence of God and, and the voice of God, it's still virtually non-existent because the masses of people out there, they don't have any God consciousness at all in their minds. Paul described the plight of us all when he stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 14, he said this, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You and I, we can't naturally receive those things or hear those things that God wants us to hear because they're foolishness unto him. 
the things of the Spirit of God and, and the Word of God and the voice of God sometimes to our flesh seem very, very foolish, for they are foolishness under Him, neither can He know them because they are spiritually discerned. There are, this sense that God wants us to have the, is because he wants us to understand the things of the Spirit of God. And we're lacking, naturally, a sixth sense. And that's why Jesus said, we must be born again. Naturally, we don't have that sense. But now, Jesus said, you must be born again. In John 3 and 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, look at what he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see it unless you are born again. In verse number 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. And so we've got to be born again. To have this sense, this, this new birth that we experience, it revolutionizes us. It absolutely changes everything, this new birth. I, I can remember being, uh, I was baptized in the precious name of Jesus, and I can remember being filled with his spirit and how it changed everything. It, it changed my, I had, a, I had a new sense about things. I looked at things differently. I perceived things differently. I translated things differently, things that happened to me. If I stayed led by that spirit, if I kept that sense, I, I, I saw things differently. I don't know if you can remember that same experience that when, when you were baptized and filled with the spirit of God, things just changed. All things become new. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. The birth of the Spirit, it gives us this sense that sin robbed us of. You see, sin robs us from this spiritual sense that we need to have. Sin robbed us of that. And suddenly, when we're born again, we recognize the presence of God. We recognize it in a whole new way. I mean, we don't just feel it now. We see it in a whole new, different way. This kingdom of God. It's a, it's a different world. It's a different dimension now. Now we start to understand certain things about life. And we start to see how things happen to us. They happen to us for a reason. We start to see that some of the things that come against us, they are attacks from, from an enemy that is warring against our soul and doesn't want us to have this sense of God. And so we start to understand that there is a real adversary out there. There's a real enemy that's warring against us. And so we start to see it in certain aspects. I'm not saying that we're looking for a demon or a devil behind every bush, but we start to understand that there are things that happen to us that are coming against us and trying to get us off track and trying to get us discouraged. And trying to get us to avoid that sense that God has given us. And this new sense that we have, it's a new world, it's a new dimension. The kingdom of God and the king of kings and the Lord of lords. A new sense is awakened. And the sixth sense, it kind of gives this, all the other senses, a new counterpart. Because even though we see things in the natural, yes, you and I still see things in the natural. We now see things in the spiritual also. You now, you can perceive things in the spiritual. I've had things happen in my life where I was able to see things in the spiritual. My spiritual eyes were open through this spirit of God, this sense that God had given me. And very familiar to the passage of scripture that I'm going to read, and I've shared it with some people. This is what the Lord kind of showed me at one time in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 16. He answered and said, this was Elisha and his servant. They were surrounded by enemy, and, and the servant was afraid and thought that we're going to be destroyed. And, and he answered and said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So Elisha is telling his servant, look, you don't have to worry about what you see in the natural, because there is something that's going on in the spiritual or in the supernatural that outnumbers what's happening in the natural. There's a good that's with us that's greater than the evil that's coming against us. 
Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so he was trying to tell his servant, look, there is more with us than there be with him. And he still couldn't understand it. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. That's seeing things in the spiritual. You see, you know, it's hard for us sometimes to imagine this in the natural. And to the natural man, it's foolishness because these things are spiritually discerned. But you start to understand that the spiritual world is very real. It's very real. And there's a super highway of spiritual activity that's happening in the atmosphere. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So it's talking about there's a super highway of activity. And when you understand things about the spirit of God and have this sense You can see things. We can hear, not just with earthly voices and sounds, but we can have our ears attuned to the voice of God now. Revelation chapter 2 and 7, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. We can feel, but not just with our hands. As we read in Acts chapter 17 and 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him. And find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You see, this is, this is our senses that you and I are supposed to feel after God. To have that relationship with God. And we can taste the sweet things of life. But now, Dev, now the psalmist says that we can taste and see that the Lord is good. In Psalms chapter 34 and 8. And blessed is the man that trusteth in him. There just needs to be... Always, in every circumstance, there needs to be a sense enough to recognize the presence and the voice of God. Because God wants to speak to his people. God wants to speak to your life. God wants to direct your life. If you don't know where to go, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know what direction to take, and you're confused in any circumstance, God wants to give you direction. God wants to give you what his desires are or his plan for your life. He he wants to direct your life. You've got to believe that, and I've got to believe that. And so that's why it's so important for us to have this sense of the Spirit of God so that we can hear the voice of God when God is speaking to us. Because if we don't even believe that God is there or that he cares or we have any sense of his presence, how are we going to hear his voice? How are we going to see the things that he wants to reveal to us if we don't have any sense that he is there we have got to sense that he is there in every circumstance in every situation God is there and God has a plan and God has a way and you're not bothering God you're not bothering God. It's not, it's not, oh, you have too many things to, I just have too many things to give you, God. He says, no, because I want all of your life. Until I get all of your life, then really I'm not the Lord of everything in your life. So I want you to give me all. I want you to cast everything that you have at my feet. Amen. Could we make it successfully in the natural without the other five senses? Could we make it successfully? Would we live complete lives? Would we want to? Why would you want to live a life without the five senses that we have? We had a conversation. I can't remember what it was just a couple weeks ago. I think Josh asked the question. If you had to make a choice, which one of your five senses would you give up? That's a hard choice to make. What would you give up? Would you give up your, uh, your sight? Would you give up your smell? Would you give up your touch, your, your taste, your, 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 your hearing? What would you give up? I wouldn't want to give up any one of them. And why would we want to? These, these senses that we have, they help us enjoy life. They help us complete life. And so we ought to want to have this sense of God in our life. We are incomplete without it. We're incomplete without it. And the reason why we don't understand that because maybe we just don't know what we're missing yet. 
Because somebody that has never seen before, they don't know what they're missing. Somebody that has never tasted something before, they don't know what they're missing. And so I'm here to tell you today that that you don't have to live a life without a sense of the Spirit of God, without a sense of the voice of God, without a sense of the presence of God. And to do so, you're living an incomplete life. Your life could be so much greater, so much. He said, Jesus said, I've come to give life and life more abundantly. Life more abundantly. So we ought not to want to live our lives without this sense of the presence of God and the voice of God that's made available to us by the Spirit of God. You know, you might have, you might say, I have the Spirit, and you might have the Spirit. I'm not going to argue with you about that. But do we have the sense to be led by the Spirit? You see, there's a lot of people that have the Spirit, but they they have not yet developed the sense to be led by that Spirit. Because that's really the benefit of having the Spirit of God, is being led by the Spirit of God. Because with the Spirit of God, you're supposed to see things differently. With the Spirit of God, you're supposed to speak things differently. You're supposed to sense things differently, feel after things differently, hear things differently with the Spirit of God. And that's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. So you may have the Spirit, we may have the Spirit, but do we have the sense to be led by that Spirit? Romans chapter 8 and 14, and we talked about this, the sons of God. And here's what it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And so if we want to be a son of God, a daughter of God, we've got to be led by the Spirit of God. And it's available for us. God is wanting, always wanting to lead us. He he is is not wanting to withhold anything from us. Sometimes we think of God as just a, a mean dad that withhold things and doesn't give us good things. That's not God. He will only give us things as we can handle them, but he will give us exactly what we need. And yes, you know what? There are times that God gives us exactly what we want. Because sometimes exactly what we want is exactly what we need. (laughs) There are times. There are times. And sometimes I like to just give my kids gifts, not because they need them, just because they want them. Anybody ever done that? Am I a bad parent for doing that? No, you've given people gifts not because they need them. It's because they wanted them. Well, the Lord said, if you being if you being evil, you can give your kids good gifts. How much more can I give 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 gifts to those that ask? So God will do this. God will do this. And 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 we can have joy in this natural life. But but but. He said in Psalms chapter 16 and 11, and I preached about this a couple weeks ago, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasure, pleasures forevermore. Just as you can develop a keenness to every other sense, I want to develop a keener sense to the voice and the presence of God. And that's what we're talking about around here, is developing a keener sense of the presence of God and of the voice of God. And I'm not talking about anything that's crazy. I'm not talking about that anything that's out there. I'm not talking about being weird and backward people that walk around with voices in our head. That's not what we're talking about. All right? This is just a solid walk with God. Having a conversation last night, it never gets outside of the Word of God. It's always grounded inside of the Word of God. And if anything that we hear, anything that we think we hear, is from, that is from God that does not line up with the Word of God, was not the voice of God. It just was not the voice of God. Because His, word will never contra- his voice will never contradict His Word. Amen. These, help, these senses help us enjoy life. And this, this sense of God that we can develop can get us into that joy, that fullness of joy that it talks about. If only that sixth sense of ours was more highly developed, that we were more aware of it. You know, it, it's, 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 hard, it's so easy for us to forget that God's always there. 
You think about it. You go on in your day. You start off your day and you say, you know, Lord, I, I want to draw close to you today. But then you walk away from that conversation and forget almost immediately that he's still there. He, he's right there. He's always there. And, and you, can, you, can, you can seek after him and you can ask him for help and you can ask him to lead and guide. If only we would use that sense and see what is really available to us by the Spirit of God. There's so much things that God has for us. There ha- that God has for your life and my life through His Spirit. If you and I will have the sense enough. Man is incomplete without the Spirit of God. We are incomplete without the Spirit of God. We weren't really meant to exist without Him. We weren't really created to exist without God in our lives. And that's why there's such a deep void, such an unquenchable spot that's in our heart that no matter what we try to cram into it, it never fills it. It just never satisfies it. We try to cram job. We try to cram relationship. We try to cram money. We put reputation. We put popularity. We do sometimes addictions and and, and other things that are unhealthy. We try to fill that void. That only God can fill. Only God can fill. We're incomplete without Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. We cannot be without Him. Amen. We're just a human doing and not a human being. You know, unconsciously, people everywhere are hungry for this, what I'm talking about. You and I, we're talking about it. We take it for granted. And people are out there looking for it. They're looking for it in all the wrong places. In all the places that that I mentioned, how do I know? Because I was there looking for it at one time. And I know you were there looking for it at one time. And you never found it. You, you, You didn't find what you were looking for. And still haven't found. But when you find Jesus, when you feel after him and you find him, in him you live and you move and you have your being. In him. From the beginning, each of our five senses were a reference point of reality and so should we develop our spiritual sixth sense to be a reference point of reality? We come to trust so adamantly our five senses that form the base of our reality that we wouldn't even think about living without these five senses. We shouldn't think about living without God. You know, and, and I, it was repeated to me just recently, and I had the Lord challenge me because there was a particular choice that my wife and I were making. We felt like it was the right choice, but I heard the voice of God asking me, have you inquired of me just yet? Have you, you've asked other people, and, and I'm serious, it, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was a strong impression from God that you have not inquired of me yet. How, how can you say that you serve and you want to follow me and you want me to be your God and you want me to direct your life and you have not inquired of me in this choice that you're about to make? And so I said, okay, God, I need to stop right now, put everything on the shelf, and now I want to inquire from you and ask. And I went to the scriptures, the passage of scripture, where the Lord, uh, who, who was it? It was Joshua inquired whether or not he should go up, and the Lord said, go up. And then and, and they went up and they, they defeated the enemy, and they had victory, and then they came against them again, and, the, and, then, and then Joshua inquired again of the Lord, and he said, God, should I go up? And the Lord says, no, don't go up. And so he didn't go up. And through that scripture and reading in that context, God gave me direction on what we should do. And so I'm so thankful that you and I, we can have that kind of relationship with God, that you can inquire of God, Lord, what should I do? In this, don't I, I don't want to. I want to discipline myself never to make a decision. I'm not talking about what type of shoes should I wear, cowboy boots or shoes. I asked my sons that tonight. <laughs> Boy, should I wear boots or shoes tonight? I didn't have to pray about it. 
You know, it would be kind of strange if I was knelt down in, in our entrance way saying, Lord Jesus, what should I do? Wear shoes or boots tonight? You know, that's just ridiculous. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about decisions that affect your life. We're even talking about, yeah, your day, when you get up in the day and you say, God, direct me today, lead me today. I want to be led by your spirit. I want to be aware of your presence. I want to be listening to your voice. Amen. And how much more it would benefit our lives. We come so adamantly to trust the five senses. I want to come to trust that sense of God that if, if, if seeing is believing, then I don't have any, anything without that sense of God. Amen. Where this spiritual sixth sense becomes common sense. It becomes a common sense. And I know my, my, it might sound, and I'm coming to a close, and it might sound like a stretch, and it might sound unbelievable, but so is sight for somebody that has never seen. And so is a sound for somebody that never heard and a taste for somebody that has never tasted. The presence of God is the most awesome thing that you and I can have and we have access to that. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was ripped from top to bottom and that signified that every single one of us, not just a priest, not just a priest had access to God. Not just a man of God had access to God, but when Jesus died on the cross, there was a veil that was ripped that said, now it's open for everybody. It doesn't matter if you have a reverend or a, or, or, or a, a brother or a sister or an elder or some kind of a, a, a title at the front of your name. It don't matter if you're, if you're a housewife or you're a 17-year-old, uh, 12, uh, grade 12, going to graduate this year. You can talk to me. You can enter. Enter into my presence. You can hear my voice. Amen. It's the most awesome thing that you and I, and it's what he died to give us. He died for us to have this available to us. He said, I don't want to just walk with them anymore. I want to walk in them. I want to be their God. And I want them to be my people. This is where miracles happen in this type of atmosphere and relationship. This is where hope is born. And the voice of God is the most important sound that you and I could ever hear. I love beautiful sounds and I love beautiful sights, but the voice of the Lord is the most important sound that you could ever hear. We receive direction, instruction, correction, hope, encouragement, faith from the voice of God. I'm closing. And I know... Some may be asking, well, how do we develop this sense? How do you develop this sixth sense? It's a good question. It's a good question. And, and I, I, I'm, I want you to understand that I have not attained all knowledge on this. I'm apprehending after this. I'm, I'm wanting more of this myself. And so like Paul says, it's not that I have attained it. I'm apprehending it. I'm pushing towards that mark. I'm, I'm trying. I'm running this race. But first of all, this is what I know. We must be born again. It, it, it's really, it, it comes down to that. Except a man. Jesus said it. Except a man, a woman, be born of the water and of the spirit. He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You won't have the sense of it. You, you'll get glimpses of it because God shows glimpses to draw us. He gives us a taste to draw us. But it's really only to draw us into the so much greater things. And so to be born of the water and of the spirit. Now from there, you know, this when you're born again, I can only look at the mistakes of people's past to correct the mistakes of people's present. And the demise of the death of this sense, it began with disobedience to the word of God. Where this all, we, where we lost out this sense of God was when we began to disobey God. When we heard the voice of God, the word of God that said, of every tree of the garden you can freely eat of, but of this tree, the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Something inside of you will die. That sense died. The spiritual sense of man towards God died when they disobeyed. And so in the garden, man disobeyed because 
Uh, and because of that, we lost out. We lost that sense. So I can only objectively conclude that the life and the growth of this spiritual sixth sense will hinge on obedience to the word of God on my obedience to the word of God, that when God speaks to me through his word, by his voice, do I listen to it? Do I obey it? When God speaks, when God says, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to go. This is what I have for you. Do I listen? How do I develop it? By obedience. You, will, you develop, if you lose it through disobedience, you can develop it by obedience. It's just that, it's no, I'm, I, I'm sorry, it's no magic wand. It's, it's really just you seeing God asking you something and you doing it. And that's how you walk. And that's every step that you take is that you see something that you should do and you do it. You have just taken a step in your walk with God. And then God asks you again. When you're firmly, he's not going to trip you up. He's not going to cause any stumbling blocks. When you're ready, he'll ask another thing of you. And you develop your walk with God that way. You develop your sense of God that way to hear his voice. And you know, Dev, that he never leads us astray. You come to trust his voice, and even though you don't understand it, you don't know why it was happening, now you can look back and say, wow. Wow. And now I, I, now I trust him more and more. Sister Melissa, if you come to the piano. So I can develop it by obeying the word of God as it, re as it is revealed to me. And also, here's an important thing. We know that sin kept that sense to the presence and the voice of God dead. It's where how it died in the first place. It was sin. So sin will keep that sixth sense dead. You know, we talk about it downstairs. Keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts. Don't allow your, your sin list <laughs> to get too deep. You know, keep short accounts. Don't let that debt get too deep. When you do something, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and the Lord, if you hear the voice of God, He will say to, like He said to that woman that was accused that day, and her accusers were standing around her, but then He said, well, He who has sin let him cast the first stone and all the accusers went and Jesus who was writing in the dirt looked up and seen the woman was there and all the accusers were gone and said to the woman where are thine accusers they're gone he said well neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more see that is a command of God I forgive you of your sin but go and sin no more he is faithful and just to forgive us. Sin separates us from God. Sin will deaden that sense of the Spirit of God. Isaiah chapter 59 and 1 says, Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened. It's not because God can't do it, neither he can, uh, that He cannot save, neither His ear heavy that He cannot hear. Here's the problem. Your iniquities, your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. He will not hear. So when there's sin in our lives, when there's unconfessed sin in our lives, and, and, and you know, the, the question that we have, how far back? I just say, God, forgive me of my sin cleanse me from unrighteousness. And now when I do something that is in an infraction, I say, God, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. I should not have done that. I knew better and I did it anyways. God, forgive me of that. Cleanse me of it, God. I don't want to do that again, Lord. And I keep a short account with God. And then there's no obstruction between Him and me. There's no, there's no separation between Him. I'm not hiding my face from Him like Adam and Eve did after they sinned. Now I can come to Him because I know I'm not hiding anything from Him. And I could never hide anything from Him anyways. 
But all he wants is that open confession because it shows where our heart is. It shows where our desires are. But sin will kill that spiritual sense. Psalms 24 and 3, it says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. We sing that song, Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not give our soul or lift our soul to another. Who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. I believe, this is what I believe, church. I believe that we have enough sense to know that there's so much more for us. There's so much more that can be seen. There's so much more that can be heard. There's so much more that can be understood about everything. When one truly loves Jesus, and when one truly seeks His face, because it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 9, it is written that I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all the things, yea, the deep things of God. That Holy Spirit is that sense. We need to search it out. We need to search it out in God. Even the deep things of God. Let's all stand. Today you can have that relationship with God. You can have that relationship with God. I can have that relationship with God. I can have that sense of God. And it's not weird. It's not awkward. It just is. It's what we need. It's what we should want. So we're going to give an opportunity tonight for a few minutes. I know it's just shortly after 8 o'clock, but I'm just going to open up these altars. And tonight, if you're desiring to develop that sense of God, there's a few things that we've talked about. You're not born again. You're not born of the water and of the Spirit. You must be born of the water and the Spirit. If you have anything in your life that's separating you from God, then you, you need to get it out. Get it out. If there's something that, that God has spoken to you to do and you haven't done yet, you need to do it. But why don't we come make our way to the front or find a place in your chair to pray and talk to God. Man, let the Lord speak to you. Let, the, let, let your ears hear His voice as He speaks to you. Touch us today, God. Oh, touch us today, God. In the presence of yes. the Lord, that's where you'll find everything, everything that you.